And welcome back to the podcast, DX Ferris. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me back. It's been a while. It, it has been a while. We were talking um, We were talking movies last time. And funnily enough, uh, I was looking at my background before we, um, uh, before we started this. And I was thinking, I hope it doesn't remind you too much of um, Bull. Um, oh, the... you got me again, Howard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do you do this shit to me? Oh. <laughs> I was not prepared for that. I don't know what I thought I was getting into, but I wasn't ready for that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh completely had me. First time I saw it, I was like, I was all in. I had no idea what was coming right. At yeah, my it's event. clearly one kind of movie, clearly. Yeah. Until yeah. it's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, wow. But uh, but anyway, look, we did we 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 we've done a podcast on a, on a, a a bunch of a whole bunch of movies and stuff. Um, but it's been awesome. a weird, it's been a weird couple years. It's been a weird couple years and I'm, I, I hope I'm back now. I've, I've certainly made all the uh, arrangements to be back now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was listening to the, the Slayer, pro, the Slayer podcast, Talking Slayer, which is uh, out now, kids have a listen. Wherever um, you get podcasts. Most. Yes. Of yeah. They'll be just sort, just, just search Talking Slayer in your podcast app and it should pop up. It did in mine. It will in yours, I'm sure. Um, thing is that listening to that, you have been very, you have been very honest at one point. Um, I well, not at one point, at several points, but um, it, you were just uh, basically saying that you've, you know, you've had a tough time. You're doing work that you were doing one kind of work two years ago, and now you're doing another kind of work, and it, it's, you know, it's physically, it's more demanding, and. Um, this sounds like this podcast is 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 a bit of a, a I don't want to be over dramatic, but a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel at last. Yeah, very much. You know, very much. You know, like a lot of people, the pandemic uh, kind of upended my world. Not kind of, it did, it did. And um, you know, I've been working my my nuts off. This is a podcast that I've been thinking about doing for maybe six, maybe eight years. I. I yeah. don't know how well you can see the the mess behind me. On one of the walls, I have one of those uh, giant things that looks like uh, what you see in crime movies when the detectives are trying <laughs> to piece everything together, like a giant map. You know, I have one of those for some life goals and projects, and it's literally been on the board since 2018. And, and do, you, do you know what? I, I now I now realize why your room is like it is okay and i apologize for listeners uh check out the video <laughs> but i know but because it basically the, this if, if if we were in if we were in the the buddy cop movie that is your life i'd be turning to you and going look at this mess and you'd be saying do you see to you it looks like a mess but yeah, me, but it's system. all there man yeah there's a there, there's a system <laughs> yeah, it yeah. is you know the system is that i've written two or three books I, i've lost count of how many i've written two or three books since i thoroughly cleaned up my office last which you know on one hand is uh you know one of my grandfathers is rolling over in his grave he used to say that you should have a clean workstation and on paper i agree with that but on the other hand i got other shit to do um yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I could have a clean office or I could have a new edition of the Slayer book and a Slayer podcast out. Yeah. And I've made that choice. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, it, it, it is very much to get back to your point. It is very much like a light at the end of the tunnel for the last couple of years. I've been working a lot of overtime, just going, going, going. Um, any of you people out there who are athletes can relate to this. You know, I work five days real hard. The sixth day that I get off, I'm pretty beat, pretty sore. But then on the seventh day, the second day off in a row you have, that's when it really hits you. Yeah. yeah. That's when you're really tough. I mean, in American in American football, rugby with pads, we'll, we'll grossly oversimplify it. They yeah. have meetings the day after a game. You know, they are they yeah. have them up and doing things, but it's two days after the game, after all these inhuman super collisions, that's when they give them time off. So it's been a tough couple of years and I've been trying to get this podcast off the ground constantly. And uh, when the 10th anniversary of the death of the late, great Jeff Hanneman, the Slayer guitarist, the guy who wrote the best songs, the guy who wrote some of the best riffs, uh, when the 10th anniversary of his death was in line, when I could see it, when it was there, like the end of the tunnel, all of a sudden it was like, the skies parted, the clouds opened up. I just all of a sudden had a lane and suddenly I was able to 
complete and updated edition of the book. I was finally able to start this uh, this podcast. And it was, uh, I think it was Gertha who said, be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. And once I, I felt like I had an open lane to that, a few great people came out and helped me and we were able to get this rolling. So after a couple of years, and I'll shut up in just a second here. <laughs> No, but after a couple of years of really being, uh, you know, down in the dungeon room and, and being breathless and not being able to make any forward progress in life, it felt um, there's there's some sunshine. You know, I'm out here talking yeah. Slayer to people and people are reacting to it. And yeah, I, I, maybe I can I swear on this? this podcast? Go, go. Dude, it's me. This I, is me you're talking to. <laughs> so at the risk of sounding like a giant emo pussy, um, I feel like I'm getting back to, to being me again by, by talking Slayer and, and talking to this, uh, working on these projects. And thank yeah. you, everybody, for listening to me. I know. It's awesome, man. Uh, I, and I, I was, I, I'm interested as well by the fact that, um, I to by the way, I totally agree with that, thinking about a podcast for years before doing one. I mean, I listened to podcasts for 10 years before I started mine. Um, and that gave me, uh, an absolute clear understanding of what it of, of how I wanted people to feel listening to my podcast. You know Amen, what I mean? brother. And, and, and that gives you a clear uh, like um, uh, persona, an internal voice. Um, you know that gives you a, a base to start from. But you've also gone for a mixture of paid, mixture of unpaid. You've gone for using Patreon to keep adverts out of your podcast. Good idea, like that. Thank um, you. And and um, but you, but like yeah, so it's one free episode. So people basically, if they only subscribe uh, for free, will get you know alternate episodes. And this is going to be twelve episodes over twelve months. Is that correct? No, no, no. It's going to be weekly episodes over twelve months. Right. Sorry. Weekly episodes. Yeah. So every every week, I'm I'm recording an episode. People that support me via Patreon get every episode. They're going to get some perks on top of that. But people that just listen for free. We'll get every other episode, basically. I'm going right. to save some of the cooler ones for the paid subscribers. But basically, you know, if you can kick in a couple bucks, a couple pounds, pounds sterling a week for your listeners, uh, then you get Slayer, Slayage, Slay In, uh, another episode in the chronological history of Slayer every other week or every week. Every wow. Week. And we're starting off with a bunch of free ones. You know, I'm going to wait until I hit my stride a little bit, you know, starting with maybe seven That's or eight. eight. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You, you can find out what the podcast is about and you can make a pretty well-informed decision about whether or not you want to support me because that's important to me. You know, as yeah, you cool. said, adverts cool. are stupid. This is This is yeah. what you get on most podcasts. I'm sure you can relate to this. Most podcasts start off with 20 minutes of this bullshit. Hey, you're hungry. What are you going to eat? You're so starving. What is there? You could starve to death. Well, mm -hmm. they got this thing now, food. You can buy food. If you go to food.com and enter uh, code talk and slayer in the, in the, uh, yeah. Yeah. And you'll box, get 20% you off. Oh yeah. Uh, do you know the one I, I hate manscaped it, uh, fucking Jamie, <laughs> Jamie Jaster is the worst. It's a, it's fucking embarrassing listening to him about shaving your balls. That's the last thing I want to fucking listen to ever. Then, yeah, then, then he does blue chew the pill. that's going to get you hard. Dude, dude, this is fucking cringe worthy. This is. Yeah. Cringe. I mean, I would do well to trade places with Jamie Josta. Do not get me wrong. Me too. Me too. I'm not going to say do that no to my listeners. Ads. Yeah. It, this podcast is all killer and no filler. I'm not going to say. There you go what I've been doing for 20 minutes at the beginning of the podcast podcasts start off. They lure you in with uh, a promise of a topic today. We're going to talk about Slayer. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about that. And then you got to sit through 20 minutes of them auditioning for a YouTube video or a, a slot on late night TV yeah. or some bullshit. No, I'm not doing that. Not at all. Yeah. no, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement. And we get it up within one, two minutes. Next thing you know, we're into the topic. Yeah, yeah, same here. And um, uh, I, I, over here, mate, the vast majority of podcast advertising is betting and online betting. And it, it, it's fucking scary. 
It really is. You you can't get away from it. It doesn't. It doesn't even have to be a sports podcast. It's it's just ubiquitous. It is everywhere because they know it's going to go away. There are no restrictions are, have just have to come sooner or later. Right. Um, yeah. They've they've done that recently where I live in uh, in the state of Ohio in the United States and uh, everywhere you look, it's betting, betting, betting. Yeah. But the th the thing is, the danger is, of course that it's never actually going to get banned. They're never actually going to ban um, uh, betting advertising because the government have the biggest game in town, the lottery. Right. So and there's money in it. And once people know, are making money, you're not going to stop that. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, as always, already veered miles off topic. <laughs> um, I, I'm 52 episodes, one a week. Um, have you got roughly, roughly, we'll see how it happens. I mean, some episodes right. are longer than others, but you know, if, if you're buying into a Patreon, you want to know what you're getting in for. So that's, that's my projected yeah. game plan. But if after you... that, it might take on a whole new life of its own. You know, maybe I'll start having guests after that, but principally what the podcast is going to be is the title is talk and slayer, a metal podcast and half-assed audio book. Yes. Yes. Uh, and what what the bulk of the podcast is going to be is a half assed potty half assed patio. i have just made up a whole new medium here. You did Howard. indeed. Patio book. It's a patio book. It's going to be me reading chapters from my newly revised Slayer full band biography, Slayer sixty six and two thirds. Used to be known ten years ago when I first published it as Slayer the Jeff and Dave years, which was that's accurate. My, at that's the time. my edition. Yeah. Uh, I updated it five years ago to the uh, the post relentless remastered edition. Gave it a whole new look, updated it, re-edited yep. it, and now five years later, for uh, Jeff Hanneman's death, a uh, few years, few years after Slayer broke up, uh, I updated it to include their entire career. So it's a book about Slayer from the beginning to the end, what it meant, what it all means, because I think it still does mean something. So I'm going to be reading chapters from that in chronological order. So we're going to start one week with the beginning. Tom, this is a spoiler. <laughs> Slayer fans probably know this. Tom Mariah was born on 6661. So really? we're going to start that chronological story with 666. And we're going to go all the way to the end. The end at this point, even years after Slayer, of course, um, is still mysterious. We still don't know exactly how and why it ended but in the book I, I tell you what we do know what i could go on the record with anyway so that's what it's going to be um metal podcast half-assed audiobook when i say half-assed audiobook i mean like i'm doing my best to read it i'm rehearsing it but i'm not going to stop and edit out every little hiss and pop and yeah. mistake because i think that's going to be a little bit more interesting yeah and is it is it giving you is it giving you a kind of different um a different experience with the book as well because i mean this is a book you know very well you're on your you know your your um second update and now you're reading it out loud as well um i'm just interested to see if that's kind of having do you know what i mean you you kind of reading your own words out loud is different to hearing them in your head when you're writing yeah, it's 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 interesting in a couple ways. You know, one of them is um, my dad told me my dad was an English teacher. I have some some pedigree. I'm not saying I'm worth a shit, but my dad knew what he was talking about. Uh, my dad told me when I was four years old, I spoke a perfectly constructed 24 word sentence. And uh, he didn't write it down. He always regretted that. But that's something he told me my whole life. Like, wow, you were barely speaking and you wrote this big fucking sentence. I continued that to my detriment to a certain point. Like as, as a young writer, I was like a jazz musician, just going all over the fucking place, like writing these long ass Byzantine sentences that people would like editors would fuck them up. People couldn't follow them. They'd miss the point. And there would be me, the asshole writer saying, well, it's simple, you know, just read the sentence, take five Take like five minutes and figure out what it's about and understand how the levels of generality flow from one to the other. And Jesus Christ, am I the only one that knows the fucking Christensen method? Yeah, yeah, I was. I was. That was stupid. <laughs> so as a young writer, I was like this jazz musician that was up my own ass doing things that were technically correct and important. But who gave a fuck? 
-hmm. Now, as an older writer, I'm obsessed with the idea of communication and getting my point across simply. I'm not trying to be a jazz musician anymore. As a yeah. writer, I'm trying to write SOD riffs. Short, <laughs> choppy, boom. Short yeah. sentence, short sentence, short sentence. And yeah. the the previous editions of the book had a little bit more of that that elaborate flavor. And I'm just trying to chop it down more. I'm trying to make it easy to follow, easy to read. So yeah, as a writer on that level, it, it is making me reassess things. And, you know, and on the other level, as a journalist, I mean, this book has been in print, as I said, off and on. No, it's been in print for 10 years now. No off and on about it. My previous Slayer book, which I wrote about the uh, the Rain and Blood album, nothing yeah. about or nothing but Rain and Blood. That was 15 years ago. Wow. You're making me feel I, old. I got it when it came <laughs> out. I'm making me feel old, Howard. But that was so long ago, and I've done so many things since. I don't have all that stuff fresh in my head. So when yes. I go back and yeah. I read this this book that I wrote 16 years ago and was published 15, and this book, when I go back, I'm thinking like, "Wow, this is this is kind of good. I, mm -hmm. I I got some good shit here. This is all right. You know, a lot of the things that I'd forgotten and. Oh, the, I mean the 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 stuff in um definitely. I mean, it'll always be the Jeff and Davy is to me. The stuff, the stuff that you researched into um, Lombardo's relationship breaking up on the court records. I mean, basically, for me, you forensically broke down um, and stated as a matter of record, and this is what always makes me laugh because I always say to people, they're always like, "Oh, you know, well, well, you know." about Slayer going to Australia and Lombardo going, I can't go. And, and, and then going, well, hang on, what the fuck? And they're all going like, Oh, they should have, you know, they shouldn't have gone without him or they should, whatever it was, they should have got him to do it. And, and everybody still argues about it today as to who's to blame and all the rest of it. But the answer is actually out there. You did the research. It's a matter of record. It's yeah. Fact, you basically, know, it's... you know, he'd been mentioning, he'd been, he'd been saying that like, you know, something was going to happen and he had a, he had a, this, court hearing coming up and yeah it was like the evidence is there to say this was dave's big well i need a pay increase or you know you're gonna have to do without me and of course you don't give kerry king, uh, yeah, kerry king an says, ultimatum okay, funny you should ever. mention it i will do without you yeah yeah i mean you do not give that man an ultimate you don't give him an excuse to kick you out the band yeah, he, he would have done better to say, listen, Carrie, I'm I'm going to I'm going to kick. I'm going to leave the band if you make me a full partner. You make me a full partner in the band. I'll leave. I'm done. Then Carrie might have considered it. But to, to put a financial gun to his head and say, listen, I'm not going to play these shows unless you do this, that and the other thing. That's a miscalculation. Uh, Slayer even wrote a song about that. You against you. Whoops. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the and and. It, it it was it, and the thing is that if we're going to go there well we have gone there you against you the lyrics are typical Kerry King because he tries he tries he doesn't succeed but he tries to keep his emotion out of it and he tries to kind of lay the bare facts out as he sees it which is like dude you were like you were badly advised you fucked you 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 know we just we just sort of let you. Um, I mean, he still doesn't manage to completely keep his, you know, his emotions in check because yeah. he's, he's obviously, you know, kind of relishing it. Um, but yeah, it's it's classic King, isn't it? It's just like really stating facts. Yeah, very much, very much. So yeah, I get deep into the breakup. Um, you know, it, it surprises me a lot of things that are in the book. You know. It, you read Blabbermouth, you see the metal websites. A metal musician can fart, and there can be, I, I call them Rupa articles, R-O-O-P-A, Rupa articles, reporting on other people's articles, Rupa articles. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. And that's yeah. that's 90%, yeah. you know, as, as a journalist, somebody who's actually studied the form, somebody who's not just typing things, I'm obsessed with content and the right way to report and the wrong way to report. And ninety percent of the metal press is Rupa articles. Somebody said this: Carrie King farted, and then I write a story about how reportedly Carrie King farted, according to this other metal site. And it's like the human centipeding of content. 
it starts with one piece of shit at the beginning and yeah. one site after another just recycles it and recycles it and recycles it until it's 10th generation repeating shit and nothing yeah. adds to it. There are yeah. things in this book that I, you know, again, 10 years ago, um, I put it out that I've still never seen anywhere else. There are things that people just have not picked up on either yeah. because they didn't want to read the book. I can understand that. That's part of what the podcast is for. Now you don't have <laughs> to read it. But there's stuff in there that's just ugly. That's the kind of stuff that uh, is not feel good stuff. The yeah. kind of thing that maybe is going to rub people the wrong way. That does not fit into what makes the press go every day. It, it's bigger than, you know, and then on August 14th, Carrie King reportedly farted. Like there's there's facts. There's reporting in here. There's ugly shit that changed things and reported or um, redetermined the band's career. Just nasty, nasty things. Not a lot, but there's some of them, and nobody has ever reported on that. You know, so ten years yeah. after that, this is still the only place you can find it. Awesome, man! Awesome. It's, it's. It, I mean, it's it's a it's a great great piece of work that you're doing, um, and and you know, su such a you know such a uh, a key band in my life. The life band I've seen more than you know anybody else. Probably the album that affected me more than anything else um as much as i love master of puppets it will it will be number two because uh rain and blood had such an effect on me i don't I, you know i love both albums deeply but it's it's the effect it had when it landed you know and it, 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 this it's this simple the only fucking album that i had on both sides of a tape a cassette where I could listen to the album and no, I don't want to listen to anybody else. <laughs> I want to listen to that again right. on that Flip side. It. Rain in Blood. And you could get it on a 60 minute um, cassette. You get it on a C60, you get the album twice. And that, that's it. That's the only album that ever did it. Now, presumably, well, rather it being 28 minutes long was a big, a, a big deal. But um yeah, you could get two albums on a 90, but no, it was like Rain in Blood was just, it had to be done. Right. Um, All killer, no filler. Ten full songs, too. It's not like an EP. It's not Haunting the Chapel. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, uh, you know, as I say all the time, uh, Master of Puppets is a cathedral. It's as big as Thrash God. It's Thrash's physical graffiti. It's like the big yeah. rock and roll grandeur moment. Yeah. So Master of Puppets, while great, is a cathedral, but Rain and Blood is a slaughterhouse. And some people are cathedral people and some people are slaughterhouse people. And I want to see that slaughterhouse shit. Well, yeah, and I let's let's keep it going, shall we? If if Master of Puppets is an opera, then Rain and Blood is a, a slasher B movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. And, you know, through the, the 70s and 80s, and it's it's funny, the staying power of 80s culture, but there was something in the air there that has made 80s material from movies, music, all that stuff is still relevant. You know, we can't not visit it. And a lot yeah. of great directors came up through that that slasher movement, you know, making low budget movements. And to tie this in with current events, um, have you seen Guardians of the Galaxy 3 yet? Not yet. No, I haven't, I'm it's, afraid. It's good. I like Marvel movies. Yeah. I don't want to spoil it for people, but there is a Slayer connection in the movie. And if Brilliant. you know Slayer Love and it. you know their history, it's awesome. very, very subtle. You, you have to you have to know what we're talking about here, but listen for that. Listen Dude. for that. I keep asking on social media, did anybody pick it up? And nobody has yet. One of my favorite movies in a cinema ever gremlins 2 <laughs> angel of angel death. of death wow what a wonderful moment to be sitting in a giant movie theater and, and hear that come off the big screen uh, well this is back in the 80s as well where you had no fucking idea that this was coming and you have no way of knowing this shit just happened you know you didn't find out three months before the movie came out that there was a slayer song in it right you know, you found out, fuck me, that's Slayer. Slayer, that, that, that's Slayer. Oh, and it's finished. It's gone. <laughs> but you still sat there going, fucking hell, that was Slayer. Christ, that was Slayer. Yeah, you know? yeah. Slayer is in there. Slayer is in the mix. That's one of the uh, the early episodes that I'm going to record in the next week or two is, is about how Slayer is 
relevant, how this is Slayer's world and we're just living in it. And you know, sometimes <laughs> they, they pop up overtly and sometimes they pop up, you know, as a theme and sometimes maybe they set the table for things that happened. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I miss him, man, but um, funnily enough, I spoke to, because th it's the next episode that's coming out, so we can talk about this. I spoke to Craig Lucero of, of Forbidden. Um, nice. And he was saying, we went all around the houses, we covered God knows how many topics, but um, uh, he was saying that, because of course, Bostaff, X Forbidden, and he was basically saying that, like, Kerry and Bostaff, uh, he's like, He's hard at it. They're hard at it. They have been for some time. And, you know, this will, you, you, you know how Kerry King operates, right? This is right. how he operates. There will not be a fucking word about anything. And then there will be, boom. It's here. This is the band. Yeah. This is, this is the band. This is the album. This is when it comes out. These are the dates. I'm back. I'm ready to rock. And right. that'll be it. Yeah, Kerry King is all in or he is all out. He's either 100% relentlessly but, on board or he's not. But but he's also that guy that wants to be in charge of the narrative and he's still that old, he's still, which is virtually impossible now. Uh, but right. he's also that record company dude as well. It's like he's signed to a label and it's like, you know, everybody knows what's happening when the label puts out a press release saying, right, here comes the album, here comes it, blah, 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 and, and that's it. You know, it's not going to be, you know, little bits dropped through social media or anything like that. It will just be, you know, stat like a new Slayer record. It will just be all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's done. And right. he's ready. And that's yeah, the first we'll Kerry know of King, it. very much the captain of Slayer, you know, very much the band leader of Slayer. And um, what he says goes, man. And I, yeah. I expect that to continue in, in his next project. I mean, I, I and and funnily enough, I remember him. I remember him being interviewed about um, about Jeff when Jeff was coming to rehearsals and trying to make a live comeback. And I, I you know, I remember Kerry being, you know, sort of basically saying that it was quite, it was hard to basically say to him, it's 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 kind of not. It's not there, is it? And he's exactly. and, and straight away, Kerry was like, he knew, he fucking knew, you know, which is the only thing that stopped Kerry feeling completely bad was that, you know, and he said, it's not quite there. And, and Jeff was just kind of like, yeah, it's it's not, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm Slayer. Uh, they're going to do things their way and, and they know when it's not there. And and that was tough for Kerry to have to say, like, you're not playing a whole show. But Kerry did that. I mean, that's that's a very dramatic scene in the book. Um, you know, Jeff Hanneman, of course, uh, was gone from the band for a couple of years. Then he came back for one of the big four shows, the one in uh, California. And he played some songs, but that was all the gas he had in his tank at that point. Yeah. Yeah. It's like two or three songs like the encore, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was is basically like like Angel of Death, Raining Blood. Uh, it, yeah. It's on YouTube. Check it out. Yeah, yeah. It's Jeff's. It's 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 kind of well. It's like his final moment in the band. Really, yeah, yeah. And, and make no mistake, there was nothing bad or inadequate about it. I mean, that was Jeff. It was it was very much a moment of triumph. It was a return. You know, he yeah. came back onto the stage. He did the best he could. But uh, you know, as the, as the story shows, Slayer are mortal. You know, it's very much. As I'm going to say in a forthcoming episode of the episode or of the the podcast, Slayer is, uh, you know, it's not like so much a rock and roll story. It is, but their whole career plays out like a workplace drama, and that <laughs> workplace yeah. drama to shift gears and metaphor is like a sports team. You know, they they were young people who had this incredible physical and mental and artistic gifts, and then over the years some of that ability went away and sometimes it waxed and waned and came back. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Slayer, Carrie King just steadfastly maintains that they just always did what they do. Like we never did anything different. We're just continuing yeah. to do what we do. Yeah. But as an athlete, when you're 40, you can still 
do the same things that you do, but you will not get the same results. It's not the same circumstances. You don't live differently. Yeah. So it's interesting to me that they're on one hand obsessed with doing things the way they've always done them, but not realizing the other factors that really affect what they create and how they perform. And then eventually, undeniably, they're not getting quite the same results either. And um, if Rick Rubin, you know, Rick Rubin was their longtime producer. Maybe he could have got more out of them. Uh, maybe if he would have worked with them a little bit more hands on, things would have been different. I don't know. Um, part of what the book gets at is that whole relationship between them and, you know, what ostensibly was their performance coach, ostensibly what was the the Phil, uh, what was the Metallica coach's name? Phil Towles? Phil, Phil Towel, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, um, on one hand, was it weak for Metallica to get somebody to coach them up and get them to perform? Eh, you can argue the points, but Slayer always did things their way and they always got the results they got. And over time, maybe they diminished a little bit. I don't know. It's an interesting way to run an organization. And that's part of what I look at in the book. You know, it's, it's not just people making records. It's people wrestling with their physical limitations as they age. Well, also as, as well, was it was it Kerry King who basically eventually put his foot down as regards Rick Rubin and said, "Look, I'm not paying paying that guy any guy any more fucking money." Yeah, that was we very much. Ever, it. We basically hardly ever see him, so fuck him. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's <laughs> classic Kerry. One of my one of my fields of of I don't know if I'm an expert in it, but one of the fields I really study is what I call Rubenology, the study of Rick Rubin and his career. <laughs> uh, as far as I can tell, I'm the only person that ever really sat down and did the math. Like uh, Rick Rubin has worked with something like 10% of the inductees in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the American Rock and yeah. Roll Hall of Fame. Nobody is close to that. Phil Spector um, didn't have as long of a career, but nobody is close to 10%. But what does Rick Rubin do as a producer? He has this amazing, you know, godlike level of, of output. You know, he's worked with mm. Johnny Cash. He's worked with U2. He's worked with everybody. And his first rock record was Rain in Blood. Yeah. At the time that he made that record, he was just some New York rap dude. And this was his first step into the greater world that he still exists in. You know, he's he's as big as music industry names get so through the years they had a relationship but what kind of a relationship was it was he the producer was he more of an executive producer as he's listed on later albums yeah uh, so it gets into the the give and take and what it meant for these two to be associated with each other you know was yeah. it political could you come right out and say that these two benefited from each other's association i don't know you make the call I wasn't there in the room, but I, as with everything, I tell you what we know. Yeah. And the thing is with Ruben, I think if you look at his career as well, he tends to really deliver when um, a band or an artist is in trouble. And like, you know, Johnny Cash's Johnny Cash career considered his career over when Rick Rubin came calling. Right. Neil Diamond. Not an alias name. Uh, yeah, Neil Diamond. A legend, had, a god, but yeah. not an alias name at ne the time. Neil Diamond had never done, uh, had, hadn't recorded an album for years and had lost all enthusiasm. The Red Hot Chili Peppers were impossible to get back in the studio and clearly all off their fucking heads. Who can we get to just, and to, oh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I think what he did with them is genius. If you watch the Funky Monks, the documentary and everything else, despite its controversial moments, um, what you learn is, and there's, and you hear a little bit from Slipknot about this, is basically Rick Rubin went, I've, I've hired this house in the Hollywood Hills, you know, where Sharon Tate stayed once and all the rest of it, knowing that that would all play in to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, tripped out, ooh, a place to create vibe. You know, and he made sure that they had that they, you know, that they could just live spot like monks. And he'd pop in and have a chat and hang out with them. And basically, he knew, he knew the only way that they could get another album out of that band at that time was to make them feel like it was a holiday and so that like they were in charge and they could do whatever they liked. Right. 
but right, that's yeah, not what you... was happening. He was in there <laughs> every day, fucking steering the ship. You know, yeah, you know, but as somebody that also, I mean, when I'm not talking about Slayer and that kind of thing, you know, I study organizational communication, I study motivation, I study management, and you Ooh. know, as somebody that studies management, it's it's my firm belief that management sets a tone for an organization. Management creates an atmosphere where good things can happen or bad things can happen. If you go into a restaurant and a waiter is being short or snippy with you, or you go into a store and the uh, register clerk is clearly pissed off, it's probably because of something the management did that made them feel bad or made them feel underappreciated or they're pressuring them to do something they don't want to do. And management has not been able to motivate them to do their best. And what Rick Rubin does at his best is he creates an atmosphere, as you said, where you can get a great transcendent, advanced, startlingly accomplished, refined album out of those dudes walking around with the socks on their dick. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, management or good management is about empowering your the 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 empowering people in a system where the good can progress and thrive and the bad can't operate in it don't operate in it and leave your organization you know and that's ideally what ideally what you want and i'll give you a fascinating person to study from my own personal experience in business but this relates to sport is um Ted lasso is is for no it's former Leeds united manager um, Marcelo Bielsa, who came over from Argentina, and our club had not been promoted into the top division, the Premier League, for 16 years. And he arrived in the summer, and that's a story in of its own. So you need to start right at the beginning. And basically, the first game of our first season with him in charge, it was all the same players that we'd had play in the last two seasons who'd finished 15th. It was all the, all the same players bar one new player. And we were playing against the team who were favourites to go straight back up to the Premier League because they'd only just come down. And we battered them, absolutely battered them. And literally 30,000 people left the stadium going, what, what, what the fuck was that? What was that? What? Those players are shit. What the fuck's happened? Next game, we win 3-1 away. Then it, and everyone's going, what? So my point is that not only did he manage to achieve one of the highest things you can possibly do, which is culture change, entire culture change, but he did it whilst retaining the vast majority of the staff. And that is like just insane because normally culture change is people who like the new culture stay, but most people leave because most people don't like change. Well, and, that's that's exactly the word, culture change. But but the fact that he was doing it with, you know, I'll say elite athletes, not all of them, but they certainly became them. But he, it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating story. I have written and that he, down. And he's also a rabid anti-capitalist. So he's he's and yet he earns thirteen million a year. It, it's just he's it, he's, he's South American. It sounds what Rick Rubin esque. Yeah, <laughs> total tangent here. Um, thanks thanks for hanging in there, listeners. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's about producers and what they do. I mean, people. Artists tend to misunderstand the role of producers. You know, and sometimes you find people that you work well with and sometimes you don't. I mean, Dave Navarro joining the Chili Peppers should have been magical and awesome. Yes. It didn't work out because people work differently together. But you you look at people that go to record with Steve Albini and some people get awesome results. Um, High on Fire, Matt Pike, good God, that album. But some people come away saying, well... Steve Albini didn't do anything for us, man. Uh, Slipknot didn't have a great experience with Johnny Cash. They said, well, what did he do? We went there and he's not really doing anything. I'm sorry, you said so, Johnny Cash. Did you mean I'm uh, sorry, Rubin? not uh, Johnny Cash. Uh, Slipknot with uh, Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin, yeah. I meant to say. Well, that was Corey Taylor, who has since apologized 
and basically because he was rather cruel about him but frankly i think kerry king would have just been laughing his ass off um because uh, yeah cory taylor really sort of got stuck into him and just said like he just yeah. due to turn up eat food you know dribble over himself and 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 fuck off but the thing is again i think slipknot were at that slipknot were too functional or rather you know cory taylor was on his game and wanted somebody to push him but Rick Rubin was all about making sure all nine members were okay. And a couple of members of Slipknot said, like, I really loved working with him. And like, you know, he, I was having a real hard time at the time and, he, and I wasn't feeling very well. And he had this special herbal infusion sent over for me and it was great yeah. and blah, blah. And uh, exactly, exactly. It's like, yeah, that's how the Rube works. Yeah. Yeah. Sending over herbal infusions. Meanwhile, that's not Curry style. Corey's in the studio tapping his foot going, come on then, come on then. Show me why you're so fucking good. Get the performance out of me I don't know I have. But that's, exactly. but, but it's like, no, you're not that dude. Yeah, so so to take it back to Slayer, you know, Slayer yes, over the years, please do. some years they got more out of Ruben and some years they got less and maybe, I don't know. It, it was a productive relationship until it was not. Yeah, but without a doubt, what Ruben, and it, amazingly with his very first metal album, what Ruben instantly got was the shitty production of Show No Mercy and Hell Awaits. That just fucked off right out the door. And all of a sudden, Slayer, who had two pretty shitty sounding albums, had a fucking incredible sounding album that was pressed so loudly on vinyl over here. You have to weight it down with coins to stop the needle jumping out the fucking grooves. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, Rain and Blood, of course, was uh, engineered by Andy Wallace. Yes, Andy Wallace That's right. worked with and Steve everybody. Etz. And Steve Etz. Yeah, Steve, Steve Etz is... Uh... <sighs> I'm going to try not to go down this rabbit hole, but he's, that's a fascinating guy. Uh, one of the Def Jam real behind the scenes people that was a important part of so many great records. And I've never really read much in depth about him. That's something that I would like to go back and, and dig into and find all the people that could talk about his role with it. I can, I can tell you, I can tell you one thing about him. He right was, um, he was, he was suggested as a, um, uh, producer for our first full length album, The Fear. Really? Yeah. By our management. And our management were tone deaf and clueless. I mean, the other band they managed as well as us was Little Angels, who couldn't have been more different, as you can tell by the <laughs> name. Um, but they had a connection in the States and our manager had a conversation with Steve Etz about um about coming over and 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 doing our first full length album. Um wow. To walk around with that as a what if in your life, that that must weigh on you a little bit. Well, I, I, to be honest, we had at the time we had Kit Wolven who wanted to remix the album after we'd um, already recorded it, uh, not with him. We had um, Matt Wallace of Faith No More. He was our number one choice. The nice. producer of the of, you know. Right. Um, so, yeah. And he was he was a like a guy we were chasing as well. He came back with a straight, no, his people were like, nah, we're not even putting this to him. Um, but, um, but Steve, it kind of, it withered on the vine. He was initially, he was like, yeah, really up for it. So we were told and really excited. Um, and then it was kind of like a, no, nah, it can't be done. Sorry. never mind. Well, that's, that's a guy who, um, a little troubled. Um, oh, he, not the he kind of guy that, not the kind of guy that was going to leave his uh, his daily environment. Oh, uh, well, I tell you what, he'd have fit in right with us. Bit troubled, <laughs> <laughs> man. But but yeah, Rain and Blood was mixed by uh, engineered by Andy Wallace. This guy, yeah. that, I mean, he's the guy that produced Jeff Buckley's Grace. Uh, he, did he, I forget if he mixed or mastered Chinese Democracy. I can't talk today. And did, did he mix um, Nevermind as well? Yeah, and that that is uh yeah, that's the big one. Nirvana's never yeah. mind. And yeah. Rain and Rain and Blood is what got him that gig. So music in the nineties changed a lot because of Nirvana's Nevermind, and it sounded as good as it did because of Rain and Blood. Yeah. 
Yeah. I've got to be honest, I'm really surprised knowing how close Kerry was with Dimebag and how much he liked Pantera. I'm really surprised that um, Slayer never went down the Terry Date route. Well, their whole Slayer's approach, I mean, the reason that they stopped working with Andy Wallace is that he worked with somebody else. Uh, he worked on, with Sepultura. And Terry said, oh, we, we can't use yeah. him now. It's tainted. That was Terry's quote or Carrie's quote. It's tainted. So uh, Slayer were generally at that point, certainly not going to do anything that anybody else had done. Yeah. So they were even willing to give up Andy Wallace just because he'd worked with somebody else. Again, very Kerry. But again, I, well, I said a lot of stuff gets um, ascribed to him. He takes he takes a lot of shit, but like Tom was absolutely on board on uh, with with the whole yeah Dave you can go fuck yourself yeah well there was a lot of a lot of years of tension in there i mean i one of the times i interviewed tom was back around the um i think it was the tour when dave was back in the band and they were playing rain and blood in its entirety maybe after that but in that general area 2005 give or take and this is in the book i asked him well well, how are things different now that Dave is back? And he laughs. He goes, <laughs> are they different? Mm. And and that was kind of the end of the subject. So Dave came back, and I think there were some mechanisms in place to make things more harmonious. But I don't know that things did ever change with Dave. I think the problems they had at the beginning were problems at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, was, I was told on... I was I was given the information by uh, somebody very very close that basically as far as Tom was concerned, um, uh, when he came back to the band, that was purely a business thing. As far as he was concerned, nothing had changed. You fuck me over, that's like you're still dead to me. I'll put up with you because you're the best guy for the job. But you fuck up again, you're out. He did, and he was. Long story short, yes. <laughs> yeah oh bands man bands they're fun aren't they right yeah you know it, it's interesting so many fans that i talk to say like well why that doesn't make sense they're supposed to be friends they're supposed to be brothers like no no it doesn't actually say that in the contract it, i know like we yeah. like to believe that as a fan but you know the narrative of slayer's career is not what we as fans and we as regular people doing our thing it's not uh it's not what we might expect you know again those guys are athletes they're on a team they're not friends when you've got when you've got five um egos five artists mentalities five people who need to be heard because that is an artist five people who are all convinced that their ideas are the best and they should be heard um the likelihood is that you are going to spend quite a lot of time arguing and ultimately um being unhappy and it's 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 a race to who gets pissed off with it and can't take it first <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's a race to the end um right look i've got some uh subscriber questions for you oh yeah absolutely lay it on me hey and let me mention this i don't know if we'll get to it but let me mention this every time i come on i have uh increasingly distant irrelevant uh inconsequential anecdotes from my existence my brief existence in the united kingdom and i have two and a half more of those so maybe we'll get to that right too. okay cool all right um well first up um cam valance says um have um has he heard from tom anything has anyone heard from tom no again yeah. what i did when updating the book i say this is what we know this is what we don't know slayer stopped giving meaningful interviews really before repentless came out and if you look at and deconstruct all the press they did around repentless just not meaningful nobody's going into depth it's very yeah. vague you know tom i think was done tom wanted to retire back in 2008 Yes. Uh -huh. If it wasn't for the financial collapse, he could well have done. Yeah, he he very well might have. So, no, Tom has not been back on anybody's radar. Yeah. But that barely changed anything. Nobody was saying anything meaningful when it was. Something fascinating yeah. to me, if you haven't seen it, uh, go on YouTube and there is 
footage from a Slayer sound check of of I think it's Tom and Gary playing Freebird. Have you seen that? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I haven't seen it. Oh, it's it's nice. I mean, they're just jamming little bits of it. I mean, you know what it's like at sound check, but it's fascinating. And I would love to see Tom come back and just tour clubs like playing all the kind of music that he likes and could never play. Yeah, I'd, I'd pay good money to see Tom just uh, walking through the classic rock playbook or playing some funk or something. But yeah. no, to answer the question, um, Tom has not been back in the public eye. Fair enough. Question that, right now, we've got quite a few questions from Stephen Smith. You're going to love these. Hey, Stephen, these. thank you for supporting the show. Uh, yes, thank you very means much, a lot. Stephen. Thank you. Right, here we go. Do you know if the Clash of the Titans 1990 gig at Wembley got recorded or filmed in full and will it ever see the light of day? We know that only a handful of Wembley songs got used for the live album and for the two promo videos, but I'd love to hear it in full. No, don't know that. Don't know that. That's that's a huge oh. question with pretty much any band. We see these little snippets yeah. of footage and man, what I would give for you know, a whole show yeah. of um, like the war ensemble video. Yeah. But no idea about that. Okay. Question. I mean, two. that's like the um, every now and then we'll talk about the, uh, the ultimate revenge tour, how much of that was filmed. Where is it now? Who owns it? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. It thinks just shit just gets lost over the years. I know our master tapes all got lost. I mean, you know, it's just fucking par for the course. Yeah. No, sorry. I can't help you on that one. Okay. Well, question two, Goes back to the previous question. Is it true that Jeff Hanneman smashed up his dressing room after the Wembley show and the police came around uh, because he was angry as someone, someone threw a missile at his guitar or monitor, which made him storm off for a few songs? Can't answer that one either. Um, right. These are these are UK centric rumors stories, are they? Yes, I was not there. If, if you were there and that happened, I'll take your word for it. But uh, no, I didn't, I didn't get that uh, that into the granular history. I might have to put you and Stephen in touch. He seems to have um, he, he, he seems to have some information here. You know, it's it's we'll see how well this this phase of the project does. You know, I I would like to do another Slayer book eventually, and I I have a couple ideas, and one of them would be to round up odds and ends like that. You know, things that don't necessarily reshape the whole narrative, but just like little grab bags like slayer trivia what happened um that is one of the things that did make hanneman very mad when something would go wrong on stage and when he sounded bad that's what would make him snap yeah yeah well no different to any other guitarist there that's for sure no sorry um, oh for two here i'm not doing no well no you can, you can smash this mate question three what are the greatest ever slayer lyrics and best ever riffs Man, best ever riffs. Well, I mean, Raining Blood, of course, not just yeah. me. That, I think that is, that's something like a Mozart composition. It's hard to think of a world in which that did not yeah. exist. I mean, you think of yeah. Mozart, dun, 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 Raining Blood, dun, 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 dun. It's like it's something elemental that you found somewhere. You know what I mean? I can't remember a world without that. And now we're probably never going to live in a world without that. So yeah. it's not just me, but decibel readers in 2008, I think it was, declared that the number one extreme music riff of all time by a lot, by a lot. Yeah. I, so I've also I've, I've also got a particular favorite as well, which is obviously the... Um, the the riff of doom in um halfway through angel of death oh i mean oh yeah. i mean it's just you know and those drums come in and sound huge and then it goes half time and tom joins in and it's just like oh my fucking god yeah the the intricacy of that is that's amazing uh that my favorite lyrics are post-mortem just the the it's not their most poetic moment <laughs> it's not their most epic moment um i mean they they have stuff that is worthy of of taking five words and turning it into a two-hour movie but my favorite personal lyrics are taste your blood as it trickles through the air just something about that is so badass taste your blood as it trickles through the air 
Yeah. I mean, that's, I love- that's, that's everything. That's the guys writing great stuff. It's incredible playing behind it. It is Tom, the narrator, just selling it, taking what the guys wrote and making it something bigger. Um, and it, it's it feels personal it feels like you're being threatened taste your blood howard as yes. it trickles through the air shit no i don't want to do that you're scaring me stop well well there's a reason why uh postmortem was the song that we covered when we toured europe um because <laughs> we're a uk thrash band we thought you know we've only got one album out not many people have heard of us we need to cover so we we covered post postmortem fucking loved shouting do you want to die every night um just yeah awesome i, I also uh, necrophobic can't control the paranoia scared to die i just love that <laughs> like 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 oh look look who's scared to die you're pathetic <laughs> you pussy scared yeah. to die <laughs> yeah death <laughs> i laugh in the face of it yeah not us yeah yeah um I, but i i do but also um i think kerry came into his 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 own kind of lyric writing in later years as well right uh, you know part of what i do through the book is i mean i i think as a whole i mean i'm not going to go on the whole rant here but i can if you ever want to hear an insane person talk for three hours and never <laughs> shut up and end up more foaming at the mouth at the end than he was at the beginning talk to me about what i think the the difference is between music writing and sports writing uh, sports right. writing, while not perfect, is so much better as a field, as a discipline, as a medium than music writing. Um, mm. Music writing, I, I'm cutting myself off here. Music writing is worse than sports writing for a lot of reasons. And one of them is they're bad on facts and they're bad on statistics and they're yeah. bad on things. Yeah. And when I'm writing the book, you know, I, I always... A couple times a day, I find myself with smoke coming out of my ears and I, and I say, Jesus, man, facts, facts are hard, man. Facts are hard. I understand why so few music writers use them. And that's that's kind of my approach as a music writer. I want to get facts in there. I want to make sure that things are correct. I want to get them right. I don't just want to say, well, Rain and Blood is awesome, man. I want to tell you what happened and why. Yeah. And uh, part of what I do through the book is I have career statistics about Slayer. Who wrote how many songs on this album? Who wrote how much music on that album? How many people did this? How many blabbermouth articles are there about Slayer versus Megadeth? There are ways that you can quantify how big and how literally significant a band is. And part of what uh, I do in that is just look at the uh, career stats. So you can tell up to a certain point, Jeff was writing most of the songs. Um, How many lyrics had uh, Carrie King received credit for when Jeff died? How many at the end? You know, how many were there in 1998? So part of what you get in the book is a breakdown of that. When Jeff died, they were just about neck and neck with lyrical contributions, but that's after Jeff had stepped back a little bit. Wait, you've um, you've you've reminded me of something, and this is purely a theory that I wanted to run past you, um, see what you thought or if there was any truth in it. But Jeff's last real, um, well, Diablos and Musica is a Hanneman album. Yeah, that is the Jeff album. And it got a fucking kicking. It did. And and is is and and basically was did was that Jeff going, okay, well, clearly I'm shit again now. So fuck that. Because his contri- contributions after that album are now I know lifestyle, inverted commas, might have played a role in this, but um it just seems that after that there's a massive fucking drop off in in Jeff's contribution musically. Mm-hmm. Wow, you you just this is a very complicated issue. Yes. So um that was a pivotal couple years for Slayer. Jeff yeah. as early, I mean, um Diabolus was 1998. Uh the previous album, Divine Intervention, was 95. Mm-hmm. Um Jeff was having physical troubles on that tour, 95, 96. That's when he literally started to not be able to do what he could do. 
Uh, we detail this in the book. Uh, Rob Flynn told a great story. Oh, uh, shit, Rob Flynn yes. From Machine Head. Yeah. Um, told a story about how uh, Jeff would just be having hard times. He had arthritis. Uh, Slayer played on the Divine Intervention Tour. They played some songs as a trio. Jeff would have to literally step off stage and do what he did um, and then come back on. So that's when his body was starting to break down a little bit. 1998, he decided that he was the one that had to write some songs because nobody else was. And that was a difficult time. You know, Hanneman, as you said, or um, Diabolus in Musica, the album does get a kicking. I really liked it at the time. And at the time, if you look at what all the other big four bands were doing, that's probably the best album out of those, you know. No problem um, with it for at the time or, or or now. I've never had an issue with it. I think it's a perfectly acceptable um, Slayer album, and there's there's some good fucking songs on there. Yeah, so I don't I don't think that the critical reception turned him off as much, but I think that he was at that part, at that point, he was going into his downward spiral. Right. Yeah. You he know, was, he coming was limited towards, by what yeah. he could do. And uh, he was, I can't say what was going on in his head or heart, but, but I, at that point, as we said, those guys were getting older. Uh, they were settling into a certain kind of lifestyle and they weren't doing the things that would make ideas occur to them naturally in 1986, 1987. Yeah. I always say it would be fascinating if you could take an artist that was in there, say 40, give or take and pretty successful just take them away from their life for maybe six months have them wash dishes in a restaurant and see what kind of ideas they come up with when they're still part of a social circle when they're still hanging out with people when they are still facing conflict when they're still getting shit from a boss when they still have um ideas coming out in their head that they can't express and nobody wants to hear you know, at that point, yeah. Jeff was very comfortable. Uh, he could stay at home a lot and not a lot was happening in his life to stimulate the kind of ideas that would come out in 1986 when he and Tom yeah. pop and Tom's Camaro and catch a buzz and just drive back and forth across California for a couple hours. I, I remember I remember Kerry talking now about how Jeff used to come over and watch the football and stuff like that. And then it 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 just stopped. He just stopped coming over. And did we now we're in different times. Yeah. Um, so I, I think in, in, in life, one of the big things that affects how well you do is, is sometimes you can get a little bit too much of yourself. You know, if all you ever do is get what you want, the way you want it, that, that takes off a certain edge and that could have played into it. You know, there were certainly other factors, but at that point, as I said, Slayer insists that they were always doing the things they did their whole career. Nothing ever changed. Yeah. But that's not good enough to get performance out of a world-class team. No, no. Does that answer Clearly your question, not. Howard? I, it does. It does. Um, uh, yeah. I, well, like I said, you know, just a theory. Just a theory. Um, and I was wondering as well if this, the, the question we had earlier from Stephen about storming off stage for a few songs – um at the Wembley Arena show was connected. Maybe it was the fact that he was having problems, but that was 1990. So I think that yeah, that kind of yeah, at that point his... that might have been just pure. I mean, young dude being angry. I don't think that was that was a physical problem, but yeah, know, sometimes he would snap and, and gear difficulty is what would make him snap. There's a well, pretty good video about that somewhere. Well, true story. Gear difficulties is what I had on the day. Because me and a friend were set off to uh, to go to the Wembley show, and um, the head gasket on his car blew, so that was the end of that. <clears throat> really? Yeah, and that was the um, uh, and he'd owned the car for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so man, you were saying, here, I'm looking, I'm looking at the book on page two forty nine. This is uh, chapter fifty six. The book now has sixty six point six chapters. That's a coincidence, yeah, yeah. I swear. I didn't make that happen. Um, one of the things that Hanneman hated, I'll list you the last three of six. Number four was traveling. He hated traveling. Number five, he said, everybody I don't know, and I hate you. 
um, <laughs> you being the listener, the interviewer, yeah. the one for the road, faulty gear. Hanneman said, equipment failures really piss me off. He said this to Guitar World, Randy Howard. He said, I literally start throwing guitars. That gets me upset. You're jamming along, checking out the crowd and having a good time, and then your equipment goes down. You can't just stop the show and say, oh, Jeff's got a guitar problem. So, yeah, that's... I would bet you six pounds cash that is what happened in that incident. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you said you had a a couple of UK-centric um, stories for me. Man, UK-centric stories... Um... <sighs> Number, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. This time last year, I was in Ireland, um, and it, it was nice. It was nice. It was incredible. Uh, I'm not going to say that coming back was a mistake because I have family and people here, but uh, I wish I would have done more to contract COVID while I was there. And, you know, the first time we talked, we were talking about doing stand up maybe and what it takes to get out there. And I said, eh, yeah, I got some, some situ. I'll tell you off the air. Yeah, at the time, my health was really bottoming out. This was 2014, 16, something. Holy shit, we've been talking for a long time. It's a lot of years. You know, at the time, uh, I was basically pre-diabetic. You know, I had no energy at all. And yeah. that was that was kind of the crest of it. Uh, I started doing, I started lifting real seriously. I stopped getting cardiovascular fitness and i was just dying like every day was all i could take to uh to get through the day and i was barely doing that so that's uh that's something long story short i got my health back on track and uh this time last year i climbed ireland's largest freestanding mountain mount nathan wow uh with no kind of additional training uh no kind of preparation uh we went to uh my my family's farm where they've been for 170 175 years something like that yeah. and the mountain was there and the mountain gave us a beautiful day and allowed us to climb it uh and that was really something so i went yeah. over those years i went from barely being able to get through the day to climbing a mountain it, it was nice so that's that's one of my that's UK beautiful, anecdotes. Man. it awesome. was something um that was not the last time or the first time that i'd been in the uk though um, I had this weird moment a couple of weeks ago where um, I was listening to random music and I heard the Jams Wasteland. Do you know that song? Are you a jam yeah. guy? Yeah. Uh, the Jams Wasteland is the song for, for people that maybe don't know them as well. It has a recorder riff in it. Uh, and it yeah. sounds like something you could hear in a, a young music class, something like that. Played by Bruce Foxton, bass player, who I met in a London restaurant. And he was very nice and gave me his autograph. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Yes. I'm listening to that at work like two weeks ago. And you know, sometimes like something triggers something very deep in your mind. Yeah. Hold on a second. There's a lawnmower outside. I'm going to close my window. <laughs> Can you hear that? No. Nope. Okay. So I, all of a sudden I flash back to 1980 when I was living in... um england with my family my dad was a scholar he had a sabbatical we lived in the town of Ware, south mm -hmm. of london yeah and i remembered we were out in london for the day he would take us to museums to see whatever get some cadbury's mm -hmm. chocolate which is so much better in the uk oh my god it's amazing um i remembered hearing that song all that time it was either in a shop or maybe on a double decker bus on a radio that somebody had, maybe both. And I remembered all of a sudden telling my parents, like hearing that and saying, I like that song. I like that song. I like that song. And they looked at me like, cause I was eight at the time. Like, well, what do you want from me? You like that song. So <laughs> what's your point? Um, and that was, that was just a trip to think like 40 years later, more than 40 years later, all of a sudden I remembered that, that yeah. song that, you know, to my mind, I never heard again until that point when I suddenly remembered it. That and that's big... that's the beauty of music. And that is as cheesy as it is, as it is the the, the phrase, you know, the soundtrack to our lives. It, it it really, really does make sense. Amen. So, yeah, recently I, I had that incredible flashback to life in the UK, like hearing that one. I don't know if it was a single, but it was certainly 
on the radio. That was something to me. But but that's awesome. The fact that music can it can bring you can take you back to that place as well, and and bring those memories back is. Uh, and the thing is, as well, is that you're now in a, you're you're now at a time in life where you can go, oh, hang on, right? I can catalog this. I can buy that song, and those memories can come <laughs> back anytime I like. You know exactly. And as I I don't know if these two are consciously connected, but you know one of the reasons why I'm doing the kind of monkey work that I do now is because my older daughter is in college. She's just turning twenty today, and we hit a point in life when I could not afford to not make money. I mean, Rolling Stone in 1972 for a cover article, cover story paid $750. I wrote for Alternative Press, the number two music magazine in America for 19 years. And when I was done for a cover story in 2021, 49 years later, they paid $750. So in all this time, it's become just an, an awful time to be a writer and to try to do that kind of thing. It's all uh, connected. It's all yeah, connected so I, I've because it's the, find... the artists. Artists have had the same thing happen to them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's just there's no money in it, but that's part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. But yeah. my my kids, I, as a parent, anytime they would say they liked something, I would make it a point to get it for them. Like I could find a song like you like that song from a movie. Um, you can't buy a copy. It's not on the Internet. I'll, I'll hook up the DVR or, or the DVR or the DVD player. I'll rip audio of it onto the computer and burn it onto a CD so you could listen to it. That's something that I just always made it a point. Like, unlike my parents, I never said, well, you like that song. What do you want from me? I'd yes. say, OK, you like that song. I got it. Yeah, uh, here you go. You have it now. You can hear it anytime you want it. So yeah. I don't know. I'm a little emo this 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 uh, <laughs> this month, obviously. So there's that. And then number three, real quickly, and I know we're way the fuck off base. Um, as part of that return to uh, our motherland, Ireland, um, my brother did one of those uh, genetic uh, ancestry tests. Right, right. OK. And and our trajectory was that uh, my dad's mom's people are from County Mayo in Ireland, up Mayo, mm -hmm. and my dad's dad's people are from County Tyrone in North uh, North Ireland. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, their trajectory was they went from Ireland and they went to England briefly, and that's when my great grandfather met my great grandmother in England. They married, and then they came to Boston as so many people of Irish extraction did. Yeah. So my great, great grandmother was, as it turns out from Yorkshire specifically. <laughs> there you Hello, go. Hello, you so, lucky man. You've got, so some maybe Yorkshire that's why we get along, Howard. I got some Yorkshire in me. Oh, mate. Well, look, it's been an absolute blast having you back on. Um, and, and I want to, I want to check in with you as, um, uh, as the series develops over the year as well. Um, yeah, please do. Please do. I will. Uh, you know, I'm, will. I'm working on the pay. We, we got to talk a little bit about Patreon. I thought that was the kind of thing you could just set up overnight. And it's not that simple. Uh, well, Apple podcast, as we've been talking about, is not yeah. so easy to get there. But I've set up the podcast in a way that I have a good month or two to build up steam and let people get used to it. It's sure. basically like I'm providing my own opening act for my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We're warming up a little bit. We're giving you six well, episodes. Well, look, it's a ple it's a pleasure to be part of your um uh of your warm up team. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for coming on, everybody. Make sure you check it out. Um, links in the description. Uh, and just search Talking Slayer in your podcast player. Thank you, hey, DX. Howard listeners. Thank you so much for listening, for having me, for welcoming me into your your time. I appreciate it. Pleasure.